Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, warm welcome to this closing session of the 2017 uh, World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa at the Dead Sea Jordan. My name is Mirek Dushek. I am responsible for the Middle East and North Africa affairs at the World Economic Forum. Um, we are joined here for this closing session by uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince uh, Faisal bin Al Hussein. So a warm welcome to you as, as well as <laughs> Dr. Hani Al Mulki, the, the Prime Minister of Jordan. So great to have you here. And at the beginning, let me thank you uh, on behalf of the World Economic Forum, thank Jordan for an amazing partnership and what a great host country you are to us every two years. It's an amazing tradition that we have, so thank you. Well, uh, we have 45 minutes for this closing session. The theme is enabling a generational transformation, which is the theme of this summit. Um, let me just remind you why we came here under this theme. There were three big stories. Uh, the first one, I think it's the most prominent one and dominant one in the news right now, is the startups. So it is the amazing potential of young people and as well as young companies in the region uh, that have really taken this summit, I think, with force. Uh, and for us at the World Economic Forum, uh, we've seen pockets of excellence, but now we feel that this is a pivotal moment where uh, a new economic model is emerging for a lot of the countries in the region and the startups uh, and entrepreneurship in general is a big part of that. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of the startups will tell you they have succeeded in spite of their enabling environment or in spite of the environment that they have been existing in. So we've come here to have good dialogue between the startups and the incumbents in business, as well as the ministers, decision makers, prime ministers, heads of state, about how can we help them uh, scale? How can we help them be more sustainable? How can we put them at the core of uh, what this region is about. So that was the second aspiration. And the third aspiration was the World Economic Forum has been working for many years on uh, facilitating dialogue around some of the crises that uh, we unfortunately face in this region and making sure that the right stakeholders are sitting down and are looking at achieving political solutions to some of these problems. And so really addressing the fragility of some of these countries, dealing with the tactics, the humanitarian catastrophes that we're seeing in Syria, uh, Libya, and other countries of the region, Yemen, and of course dealing also with the big picture, the political picture uh, as well. So these were the three big stories. Um, and, you know, people always ask me, so what, what has actually happened here? Those are discussions. Well, let me just list for you some of the things that have actually happened here. Uh, in addition to the startups, we had a gathering of religious leaders from uh, different faiths of Iraq and beyond, talking about the future of Iraq after Mosul. Uh, we had an amazing meeting of global shapers who are people under 30 doing amazing things in their, in their own environments. We launched two big initiatives in Jordan, where Jordan is playing a very important role. One is called Internet for All, which is looking at the digital infrastructure uh, in Jordan, including uh, among uh, Syrian refugees. And we also launched a new partnership called Sustainable Development Initiative Partnership, where Jordan is becoming the regional hub for enabling blended finance toward infrastructure projects. We had dialogue on between Palestinian, Israeli, and Arab leaders on what next on the uh, uh, Israeli and Palestinian dialogue, and many, many other initiatives uh, that I could 
enumerate here, just to give you a sense of how big the summit was, how many discussions have happened, both in the official program uh, as well uh, as in the private program, and more importantly, the outcomes of this summit for Jordan and for the region and for the international community. So now we will have about 40 minutes together. Uh, I would love to hear from our panelists, from uh, amazing stakeholders of the World Economic Forum that come from different walks of life. They represent different sectors, possibly different generations. So it would be great to hear from you how you have seen the summit, what are the highlights, what are the things that you think are the most relevant for your work, but also for your country, for your society. Um, so let me first introduce you. I am uh, joined here by uh, Hassan Hasbani, who is uh, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, and Minister of Public Health of Lebanon. Um, I am also joined here by Ambarin Musa. She is the CEO of uh, Souq Al Mal, and you are one of the startups uh, uh, that were selected together with the International Finance Corporation. Uh, I am joined here by Khadija uh, Idrisi Janati, who is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, and uh, uh, you are a founder and CEO of uh, KMK Group, a communications company, but also you work a lot on women empowerment in Morocco uh, and uh, beyond. Uh, I am joined here by uh, Sana Hawesli, uh, who is also uh, part of the startup initiative here at the World Economic Forum coming from Damascus, so welcome. And last but not least, I am joined here by Syed Saleh Al-Hakim, uh, who is director of the Hekma Center for Dialogue and Cooperation in Najaf, and uh, someone who has helped us bring uh, uh, this amazing community of religious leaders from Iraq here and we'll be speaking a little bit about uh, what they did here. So, Hassan, Deputy Prime Minister, let me start with you. Um, I saw you um, sitting down spontaneously with uh, some of these startups. And so I'm, uh, I'm curious what you talked about, but of course I'm curious, what are, what are your takeaways? Um, what are you gonna take away uh, with you to Lebanon as you start uh, uh, your work on Monday back in Beirut. Uh, what are the things that uh, really will uh, stay with you? On a practical level, the conversations that I've had uh, in this meeting were fascinating at all levels. So we've had like political meetings, uh, technology-driven meetings, futuristic meetings, and uh, the one that was closest to my heart was the impromptu gathering that happened with the uh, uh, young global leaders uh, who were participating from Lebanon in, in this event who were telling me about their projects and uh, their aspirations. What I would like to take with me from this meeting is a thought on how we can continue creating hope for this young generation in the region. And hope manifests itself by showing them examples, although they may not be big examples or consistent examples, but showing them examples of success, showing them that we are taking action to create the right environment for the young population of this region to stay in this region, be active, and fear not the future. On my personal, capa in my personal capacity, as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Health, I had promised this group of people, that I will take their cause to the highest possible level within the country, and that we will work together on creating the right environment for them to succeed, and for more of them to join the group of young entrepreneurs who are keen to be creative, to be active in their society, to be active in their economy. We're shaping the future in a very, very difficult environment. The region around us is in turmoil. We have so many challenges at the political and social level, at the economic level. Yet, there's this bright light shining 
with a group of young people who are still keen on being creative and productive in this part of the world. So what we need to give them, what I need to give them as a young, uh, recent uh, politician, <laughs> not seasoned, but recent, what we can give them in terms of hope by taking practical action and developing the right environment on the legislative side, on the regulatory side, but most importantly, on the investments and on the encouragement and support side. Thank you, Hassan. Let me turn to Ambarin. Um, an amazing startup, a comparison site, uh, you know, helping a lot of people that would not normally have access to the relevant information to make the right decisions uh, financially and otherwise. Um, so, you know, we had the Deputy Prime Minister now speak about uh, his takeaways. From your uh, chair, what are the things that you would ask governments in general and decision makers to do to help companies like yours to succeed so that we don't have to say you've succeeded in spite of the environment, but rather you've been helped and it's an amazing uh, uh, environment that you exist in? Um, so, so there are two main areas I think we struggle a lot and I think I would probably be speaking on behalf of most of the startups in this room. Uh, the first one is talent and the second one is regulations in spite of. Um, and the first one when we talk about talent is it's, it's extremely hard to find local talent um, and local talent are generally people who are loyal, who stays through and want to build a career with you as a company. Mm. Um, and I think that's where, uh, and we've been talking about that throughout the whole forum, is a real investment into education. Now, when we say about education, it's about um, educating um, from a very young age about entrepreneurship, educating them about um, the type of new roles coming on board, the types of new careers actually coming on board. But I think education is probably your key factor and your most critical, I would say even above regulations, um, to bring on board and to actually create that sustainable environment. And it's not just about building that environment for the next one year or two years or the startups of today, but building that environment for the next generations of startups. Now, um, we've talked a lot about startups in the last, what, five, years, 10 years, but I, I, I do want to point out something is this region has been built on entrepreneurship. I'm talking about 40, 50, 60 years ago. If you look at all the big companies, the, the biggest employers of the region, the Algeria Group, the AMR, they were all one-man set-up uh, companies. Mm. So entrepreneurship in this region has been forever existent. And I think now there is a lot more talks about it. Um, and fair point that education is probably one of the, one of the biggest aspects. Um, the, the second point I would like to make is, is regulations. And we've gone through three rounds of funding for Sukal Mal until today. And we're going through another one now, hopefully to close very soon. And one of the big questions or discussions we constantly have with investors are, how big is the market? It's a typical question that comes out every single time. And we go out there and we talk about the opportunity of, of the region as a whole. Um, and the first questions we get asked generally is, yeah, but how much effort does it take to move from one country and expand across the region because you've got different regulations, different jurisdictions, different dialects? Um, how easy is it for a company based out of the UAE, based out of Jordan, based out of Egypt, to seamlessly say, this whole market is addressable for me? How much is it going to cost me to enter the Saudi market and to enter Oman and to Kuwait and to Qatar? Now, there's been a lot of, of changes I've, I've heard throughout the forum, sandbox regulations being put in place, um, different economic zones put in place, but I would love to see this going much faster. Now, the dream, and I'm sure a lot of the startups would agree with me here, is the dream is to have one currency, one region, no borders from a talent perspective, no borders from a regulatory perspective, I know this is probably almost impossible and it's going to take years, but step by step, I think one of the areas we're really looking at is how to make that expansion of the region for us much, much easier. And not only it makes an environment more sustainable for us as startups, but it will attract a lot more foreign investment into the region because suddenly the addressable market becomes easier to penetrate. Thank you. 
Um, Sana, you, uh, Ambarin just mentioned education and, and talent and how important it is for uh, startups uh, to scale. So you, your organization, I'll let you talk a little bit about your organization, but you, may, you work with children. You, you make it possible for children to be future makers. To, and, and so how should education change, evolve, to empower the next generation, in your view, being in this space? Thank you. Actually, we're working on tools that make it possible for kids to feel free in order to build their own things. So we are not giving them toolkits with an instruction to, with the instruction book to follow, and this is this is it. So we are trying to uh, make in the kid a lifelong learner uh, by providing uh, the kids with the tool, with the right tools that give them the opportunity to have this educational experience with high ceilings and wide walls. So there will be no restrictions around this uh, educational experience. We are working on finding the best way to deliver this content in order to make the kids feel free exactly uh, to express themselves and do the, uh, the projects they really like to do. Uh, we work in the field of electronics because we found out that it's a good step to start to let kids start in this field. It gives them a good sense of uh, building tech and it's really required uh, uh, in the near future since in 2025 uh, the uh, statistics says that uh, a lot of jobs require uh, the people to have technical skills and to know how to build tech. So we're trying to find out which are the tools that really fits in, in, this, uh, in the next market, marketplace that will uh, replace the traditional things we are facing right now. Uh, we, I think that uh, giving right tools would be uh, the best thing we can do to evolve education, uh, to make it a better future. Just makes me curious, how, how did you get to this idea and, and how does it work, if you can? Yes. Uh, we work with, uh, in, uh, in a local community in Syria called Wikilogia, we work with graduate students and, uh, and university students on a lot of te technical activities. But we tried once to try these activities which are senior with kids. And we, are, we were amazed by how these kids were uh, enthusiastic about doing more of this. We, on, Later on, we uh, liked this idea and we discovered that maybe we have to build some tools that make this process easier for them. Mm -hmm. uh, the kid can build his project and uh, our software can uh, track this progress and give him the right feedback at the right timing. So this is it. Very interesting. Thank you. Khadija. Um, moving to the digital, so there is, of course, the, the opportunity of digital. Uh, I think 80% or 90% of the startups that we gathered here are high-tech, which corresponds to the general trend. Yet, of course, there are risks um, uh, involved as well. Um, so um, you, you work in communication, so how, how do we manage this balance between making sure that uh, we are uh, using social media, we are, we are inclusive, we are using digital at the same time managing uh, the risks uh, that are there as well. Well, um, as you said, um, I mean, the digital transformation is here and we need to adapt to it. Now, there are few ways uh, 
we need to have some checks and balances about the use of uh, uh, digital uh, in our everyday life. Um, some um, portions of the population would be more sensitive to the use of digital and more fragile when it comes to that. I am thinking particularly about children um, as there needs to be, uh, they have to be exposed to digital. They have to be exposed to the internet because many benefits would come from that. At the same time, I think that there needs to be some kinds of uh, role that the parents should play uh, by showing that there is a real world. There is a real world which, which need, we need to be still um, anchored in. And then this is the best use that we can do of digital. I think there is another word that is very important when it comes to uh, 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 digital and social media, more importantly, which is uh, trust. Um, one of the challenges of uh, the use of uh, new technologies, all the, the social media and all the digital information outlets is the, uh, the veracity of the information that they are conveying. Uh, this is why I think that a few, uh, maybe a few weeks ago, Facebook has uh, uh, announced the recruitment of about 3,000 people that will only be uh, taking care of verifying uh, the, the information that is being circulated on social media. Uh, the digital transformation will uh, impact uh, drastically our ways of life. Uh, positively, if we know how to manage it, it has to come into education systems. It has to be considered when we uh, build our entrepreneurial systems uh, and ecosystems. It has to be also considered when we communicate. No single company today can rely only on classic media uh, in order to convey its messages. We need to integrate that, but the use of it has to be uh, done in a responsible way. So I think that trust and responsibility are two words that we definitely need uh, to integrate while dealing with them, rather than thinking of control as it is being thought uh, these days. So let's be aware of all the benefits before considering all the risks uh, that this can, can bring. Thank you. And of course, as I mentioned in your uh, introduction, uh, you work on women empowerment in Morocco and beyond. You were part of the discussions here as well. So what is your main takeaway there? What is the role of women in the future economy of, uh, of this region? Um, the, uh, the MENA region is very specific when it comes to the, uh, uh, to the place that is given or occupied by women in the workplace, but in society in general. There, there are many disparities from a country to another uh, when it comes to um, integration of women in social, economic, and political life. Um, it, there are countries that have really uh, uh, succeeded to uh, create the enabling environments for women to play roles for in the front of the scene where others still need to, do, to make many efforts. But uh, some feelings are really shared among all women coming from all uh, countries of the region, is that women still, uh, uh, are still looking for that environment that would allow them to take their own decisions. I think that, and we were talking about that in the, the early session, where even companies, if I talk about the private sector, even companies who would like, who are really aware of the importance of putting women on the front of the scenes, when they want to make decisions concerning how to do that, they do feel they know what women need. Where we they do studies, the results are usually very different from what they thought. They thought that putting a nursery in a company would help women, whereas women are most uh, mainly looking for mentoring programs, for example, or looking for some uh, empowerment, new skill development uh, tools that the company should take. What I want to say about, about that is that it is true that having women more active in, uh, in the economy would definitely bring the economy up, but please let, let not link the uh, bringing women to the economic sphere to the development of that. Let's just take it as a normal human right. We have 50% of uh, the Earth's population are women. So it's normal and natural to find 50% of all areas of life occupied and invested by women because this is the only way we can create a serious balance and we can become inclusive societies. Thank you. 
Said Hakim. Um, the role of values in uh, uh, building this future. So what do you think, uh, how important val values are for fostering prosperity in this, in this uh, new generation? What is the role of religion also in that, in that respect? In the name of God, all merciful or compassionate, first, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank the leadership of this uh, forum, and uh, I would like to thank this country, Jordan, our dear Jordan. I thank His Majesty the King and the government and the Jordanian people for the hospitality that I have seen and witnessed. When I was on my way to Jordan, as I was coming to Jordan, I thought, I came, of course, along with my team, the religious clerics, I thought that we will feel alienated, that we will not feel at home amongst this group of business people. But I leave this conference feeling that I was amongst friends both men and women, who share our vision, who share our mission. We carry a joint mission, a joint message. The human being searches for interests and carries values. No human being is devoid of values. We believe that religion constitutes the collective values of a human being. A person can have his own religion. It is not just collective religions. Uh, the prophet, God's blessings be upon him, he said, the path to God, there are so many paths to God that are as many as there are people in this world. So each individual can have his own religion or her own religion. Religion is necessary for our life, even the life where we pursue our interests. So I thank you. I thank you for giving a share of this forum to religious clerics in this economic forum. We need to draw a better future for people whereby there is a balance between values and interests. This is our message. I also come out of this conference with great optimism, great optimism deriving from the presence of these young women, young women that give hope that there will be a bigger role for our daughters in the future and a bigger role for youth in the future as well. What also had a great impact on me in this meeting is that when I think that our sons and daughters, if they become like us, then we have not progressed, we have not moved forward. I want my children, our daughters and sons, to be better than us. And this is what's beautiful in this region. This has been a new experience but I felt at home in this country and in this gathering. This experience has given me a bigger responsibility because I found that religion has to have a place, a bigger place, has to play a bigger role. And religious clerics have to play a bigger role in the field of values when we, religious clerics, carry the mission of humanity, we have to play a bigger role in society. When we think of humanity as a single family and that we are responsible for those values, then we have completed our mission when we achieve this. What encouraged me also is my team, the team that accompanied me, a team that represents the Iraqi mosaic, uh, the Christians, uh, Sunnis, Shiites, we all share common human values. This gives a beautiful image of my country, Jordan, that has lived 
through many conflicts, and now after defeating ISIS, defeating Daesh with Iraqi hands, now all Iraqis feel that all the fake differences, all the differences that have been created between Sunnis and Shiites and others, now the Iraqis feel that they need to be united, that these differences are not real. And thank you very much. Thank you once again. Said Hakim, I have a follow-up question. Um, a lot of people that I met here were asking me what, what will come after Mosul. So you, you addressed it to a certain degree, but what would be your message? You come from Najaf. What would be your message to your country and to the people in your country so that once the military campaign uh, is finished, what's next for Iraq? Today, the people have reached an excellent level of awareness and recognition that religion cannot be pushed into politics. This is completely wrong. Religion has its own special place, and it needs to be dignified, it needs to be respected, it cannot be involved in this political bazaar. Our people in Mosul, in Najaf, in Basra, in Baghdad, they do not prefer the religious political movements. They want to have a civil state. Najaf always called for a civil state. We don't want also to alienate religion from life. Religion is an integral part of our life. But we don't want a government that governs in the name of religion and in the name of God. The, our slogan in Najaf is that we do not want a religious government. We, not, we want a government that respects religion. This is the message that has finally reached our people, and now people believe in this. And our message to decision makers, as I said yesterday, we met with an excellent group of politicians and decision makers. We told them that political Islam, we've tried political Islam. It was not helpful. It did not serve us. Please help us hold real elections, true elections in Iraq that allow people to express their opinions. The Iraqi people prefer a civilian government, a government that respects religion but is a civilian government. We are sure that our people are aware of this and they hope for a better future. Our problem in Iraq is not problems or conflict between sects. The problem is political Islam that wants to shove religion into politics and force it into politics. And it's historically this has been a problem. If you look at history, when the sacred was when the sacred was involved in politics, it ruined politics and ruined religion. And this is our issue. Hassan Hasbani, um, Lebanon went through um, a very painful period. Um, in, in history, you were part of a, a meeting that we had where uh, Said Hakim was also, I know this was part of the discussions. You as a representative of your country, what have you learned as a society yeah. in terms of reconciliation, rebirth, compromise? What would be your tips? Well, Lebanon has gone through that phase uh, for quite some time. And we've learned many lessons. And I believe there are many lessons that have been learned in Lebanon that can be applied to the region as well. We're still learning. We're still on a long journey, but we're getting there. We live today in a world that's transforming at a very fast pace. Values, ethics, relationships are being redefined at an unprecedented speed and they're being challenged at an unprecedented level. 
Technology has driven many things forward, have improved, has improved the lives of people. We're at the dawn of an industrial revolution that will actually continue transforming our lives. Yet, we live in a part of the world that's catching up with all of that while reinventing itself and creating itself from a governance perspective, from a social contract perspective. So what's happening to the world is happening to us in the region. Mm -hmm. In addition to what's happening to the world, we're still struggling with basic existential questions. What we learned from these discussions, what we learned from our experience in Lebanon in general, is that this is time for reconciliation and inclusion. Society today needs reconciliation and inclusion. The lack of inclusion has led to conflicts. And I do agree that these are not religious conflicts as much as they are conflicts driven by partially social exclusion, partially economic reasons, and partially a drive to control and supremacy by various social, ethnical, or groups that group themselves under religious entities. Yet this is a society in the making defining itself. So when we talk about rec reconciliation and inclusion, these are the two principles, the two main principles that will drive our society forward. Inclusion in governance, so no group or constituent of society controls another group. Everybody is responsible for building their own country. Everybody is responsible for creating stability and prosperity. And everybody would be responsible for any trouble or conflicts. When we talk about building the future, and this forum has discussed these topics at large, with the new changes in the world, with the conflicts that exist in this part of the world, there's no doubt that smaller entities, cities, are rising as big economic entities instead of nation states across the world. Yet nation states still exist because of various cultural, social, economic, and security needs. At the same time, we have a big question mark about the way the world is running itself, the economic models that we're living in. There's a struggle between liberty and equity. Today, we need to have both. We need to have a free market economy that is socially equitable to a large number of every country's population. There's a struggle between efficiency and economic efficiency and the community, where communities felt excluded because everybody was racing for economic efficiency and gains. Communities felt that they're not being looked after and then they rose and created a loud uh, voice. So efficiency with community attention is also needed, particularly in this part of the world as communities are finding themselves and interacting with each other. A level of reconciliation, inclusion of all entities in every society in this part of the world combined with a decentralization of administration that eases any tension or competition over resources or over control can create a much more peaceful environment to our region, the same way it is creating a stable environment for the world that's embracing a new industrial revolution, that's embracing technology, embracing entrepreneurship and innovation in a more inclusive manner. This is how I see the world evolving in the next couple of decades, and this is particularly how I see Lebanon and the region in the Middle East evolving to create stability, create prosperity, and build a better future. Thank you very much. Uh, beautiful words, thank you. Um, yes. I'm Barin Khadija Sana. You are entrepreneurs. 
I'm curious because normally entrepreneurs, they don't like talking too much. So uh, you like to grow your businesses. Uh, so you spend three days here. So if there was one thing that you would want to do out of this, what is it going to be? What, what is the one deliverable for you that you're going to take away from you, to take away from here and really uh, take it with you, uh, you know, to Morocco, UAE, and Syria? So I'm just curious, Khadija. Well, my journey here was very special. First of all, uh, as an entrepreneur, but also as a co-chair of this, uh, of this uh, summit. So being a co-chair allowed me to follow the discussions before okay. to see how things were evolving. And what really I was feeling is, a, uh, is the determination of all the co-chairs, but also the WEF team, to make this summit special by putting it to action and not only to talks. And I was wondering how it's going to be, because when you are in a meeting where you have more than 1,200 people with all these different sessions, it's a little bit, little, bit, little bit hard to get into actions. I think, and I will repeat that, the parts of the magic and the, the strength of the World Economic Forum is its ability to bring around the table all the stakeholders when it comes to one specific topic. Uh, you did that, uh, but also there, were, there was a, a number of words that were coming up during the last three days, and these will be my real takeaways uh, when I go back to my home country. Uh, the idea was about developing a positive narrative about the region, about the good experiences of the region, and about the success stories of the region, and I think that there were also many calls for action, uh, starting by the launch of the initiative, uh, the startup initiative, and we have talked also about other initiatives that, were to, were, uh, that are being launched in Jordan. Few words that are uh, really in my mind following these three days, which are creativity, innovation, inclusiveness, initiative, uh, revolution. I'm talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So I believe that few words have been coming up f few times during these three days that we will take all of us with us and that will make us rethink our vision, uh, uh, rethink what we are doing in our countries and in the region, and mainly rethink uh, the, uh, the future that we see for our countries and the region. We as entrepreneurs, we sometimes are facing uh, challenges that make us just rethink our minds, but after living such a great experience, uh, I think that most of the people who are here will come back to their own countries more confident in the future of the region, and more uh, trusting their ability to make the region a better place to live. Thank you, Khadija. Sana? Actually, I feel privileged for uh, being here with you all. So, basically in Syria, we don't have really the chance for uh, having us in such conferences or really big events. So, what I think I can take back with me home is the hope and the enthusiasm I found in VCs and investors towards the Syrian uh, people who are really working hard. In Syria, we don't, they really don't know that the world is really excited what's, ha what's, what's the creativity is happening inside. And maybe we should find a way to bridge this gap between how much technology industry is going inside Syria and how much investors are really excited about that outside. We have a really uh, powerful workforce inside Syria which is really expert and senior in technology. Uh, that was really weird for many of, uh, of the people I met here in, uh, in the conference. So maybe Letting people know more about Syrian, Syrian people, how startups are operating there, uh, shading, putting more light on that, maybe give us much more opportunities for the Syrian youth. We, we have a great lack of opportunity, and I think after this uh, forum, after meeting you all in forum, uh, I will go back with a great hope that uh, the word is really here waiting for talents from Syria 
to uh, just track the opportunity and do the hard work to get there. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, throughout the last three days, it's been in incredible. Um, really way above the expectations I had coming out here. But the common theme I heard through everybody I spoke to, be it uh, people from the government, uh, VCs, was reform. And that was extremely a great sense of relief. I started the business around five years ago, and I can tell you it was very, very different. Trying to get into different jurisdictions was very, very, very difficult. And I come from the financial services industry, and I think, as you would all agree, it's probably the most regulated industry you could imagine. But not only that, probably the least disruptive industry in the region due to different regulations. And honestly, I've met people from Kuwait, um, from Bahrain, who, what amazed me was that mindset of, we need to move forward. We need to welcome you with open arms. Here is my business card. Come out and talk to us. Take a plane. We're going to get you out for the day. We're going to get you to meet all the regulators, the central banks. And we're going to try and do whatever needs to be done to make the change and allow you a sustainable economic environment to do business, whether or not you're local. Um, and, and, and I think that was, that was really one thing that I would take away from me. It wasn't just about getting the business cards, but knowing that we're welcome and making the effort of finding out more and understanding how to set up in different countries. But reform and, and, and the enthusiasm of change is what really, really struck me. Thank you. And, and I can assure you we'll be, we'll be working on it more. This is what we are hearing as well as the World Economic Forum. And there is a strong coalition of uh, incumbent business leaders, startups, and, and uh, political leaders who are starting to work on it even more after this. So I think there is a great coalition. We'd love for you to be part of it. Great news. Uh, rapidly, uh, also very practical, one thing, Said Hakim, uh, Hassan, one thing you're going to do uh, because of the summit. Maybe uh, Hassan. Okay. Um, as I started off by saying uh, very quickly, just keep focusing on encouraging entrepreneurship. And when I say entrepreneurship, uh, it's uh, at all levels. We have entrepreneurs in different, they're not all tech startups, uh, to, be, to be clear about this, and the large uh, part of society is, uh, is made of people who do things with their own hands, uh, who uh, produce things uh, for everyday life. We need to have more of those. We need to create more jobs for those as well. So one take is to keep pushing forward with supporting entrepreneurship while supporting big enterprise also to be more socially responsible. And that's quite important. And it's a big takeaway from, from this discussion. Thank you. Said Hakim. What I take away from this meeting is greater determination and greater conviction that dialogue is the best way to reach the truth. The more we focus on dialogue with the other, on respecting the principles of the other, we have worked in the center, Al Hikma Center, since 2007. We worked on the national level in Iraq. And we reached several important decisions. Allow me to present to you a sample of our decisions as religious clerics and intellectuals. We have the Erbil Declaration in 2016. In this declaration, we asserted uh, citizenship. The true solution for Iraq is to consolidate a country of citizenship where everyone is equal and uh, that protects the rule of law. We also asserted the need to promote a civil state that respects uh, 
all beliefs uh, within the Iraqi population. We also asserted the need for a principle of true reconciliation between the Iraqi people, uh, strengthening mutual confidence. We also asserted the role of religious institutions, educational institutions. We called upon religious clerics to educate their followers and to review the religious curricula in schools and universities. We called upon the Iraqi government to build peace after Daesh, after ISIS. We called upon the civil society and NGOs to remove anything that harms citizenship and citizens. We asserted that we need to pay more attention to youth and also the role of women. Iraqi women are a source of pride for us. We have two models of Iraqi women here in this room. The first director of this, the Waqf, the Christian Sabian Waqf, a woman that we take great pride in. She represents Iraq in Jordan, Safiya as suhail She is a wonderful woman, a respectable woman. This strong presence of Iraqi women, as well as the other women, this lady here from Syria, this sends a message to everyone in this region that we, men and women, uh, politicians, businessmen, religious clerics, we want life, we seek life, and we will just... Uh, defeat all of these anti-life uh, messages. All the panelists, I think it's, it's really what, what we had in Davos, responsive and responsible leadership. So really being able to have the values uh, and the decision-making capability to be responsible, uh, but also responsive enough so that you really usher in um, more progress, usher in the, the latest developments, new economic models, being able to use the opportunity of the digital economy uh, for the benefit of the region. So we've heard from a, a great cross-section of, uh, of industries, uh, also an intergenerational view, which I don't think could be better for the closing. So thank you very much for your uh, words and perspectives. Thank you very much for and joining us here. Kalima Akhira, this. One minute. Kalima Akhira. <laughs> Kalima Akhira. Ani Wasi. My advice to young men and women and business men and women when one starts a certain life, should have set objectives and goals. I hope our companies, institutions, and others to put value objectives in addition to interest objectives. Think what you want to achieve on the material aspect and how you achieve your values too. This is an important message from the beginning, early on. And one continues to monitor uh, the process, how much value uh, was achieved and how much interest was achieved. This concludes the 2017 World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa. I'd like to assure you of the World Economic Forum's continued support to the region and looking forward to coming back to Jordan soon. Thank you.